With no significant pandemic developments this week, the province largely turns its attention to announcements in several other sectors, including highways, agriculture and disability services. One of the most significant for Nipuan area is the announcement of the formation of the Immigrant Advisory Council to serve as an expert panel to recommend improvements to our current immigration policies and programs. It will be co-chaired by John Reyes, Advanced Education Skills and Immigration Minister, and Dr. Lloyd Axworthy, and will consist of individuals from various immigration adjacent sectors, from people who have experienced the Provincial Nominee Program firsthand, to representatives from business and academia. The Council will also, Stephenson says, include urban, regional and francophone representation. Nipua is specifically named as a region outside of Winnipeg with significant immigrant settlement. Don Walmsley, Executive Director of Nipuan Area Settlement Services, is optimistic about the Council as long as it meets those representation goals. We will be sitting down with him in the next few weeks to discuss the implementation of the Council and how the results will affect us here in Nipua. Here are Premier Heather Stephenson, Advanced Education Skills and Immigration Minister John Reyes, and Lloyd Axworthy, former Canadian Minister of Foreign Affairs and current Chair of the World Refugee and Migration Council. Good afternoon. Bonjour. It's uh, my pleasure to be here today. My name is John Reyes, Minister of Advanced Education Skills and Immigration with the Province of Manitoba. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge that we are gathered here on Treaty 1 territory. Pour commencer, j'aimerais reconnaître que nous sommes ici aujourd'hui sur le territoire du traité numéro 1. And in Manitoba, we reside on Treaty 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 lands, the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. Au Manitoba, nous résidons sur des terres des traités numéro 1, 2, 3, 4, et 5, des territoires traditionnels des peuples Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota et Dene, et de la patrie de, de la nation Métis. It gives me great pleasure to be here today as we take an important step forward in our commitment to grow immigration to Manitoba and address Manitoba's labour market needs. We know immigration and a diverse workforce con contributes to a strong economy. Today I'm pleased to introduce Premier Heather Stevenson to make an important announcement. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Reyes, uh, for your introduction today. Um, also want to welcome Dr. Lloyd Axworthy, who's here with us today, uh, former President and uh, Vice Chancellor of the University of Winnipeg, former Federal Foreign Affairs uh, Minister, among many other ministerial positions, and a longtime community leader and a well-respected Manitoba Manitoban. It's great to have you with us here today, Dr. Axworthy. On Friday, I was pleased to announce that we are accelerating our plans to lift public health restrictions starting this week, uh, with the intention to lift all restrictions within the next month. It's time for a new normal to begin in Manitoba, one where businesses can thrive and grow and do what they do best, employ Manitobans and offer services and experiences that Manitobans rely and depend on. This fall, throughout uh, my leadership campaign, I had the opportunity to meet and engage with many business owners and leaders from across the province, all of whom have stressed to me the difficulty in recruiting and keeping skilled and, and non-skilled labour uh, within their workforce. As, as committed to in the uh, speech from the throne and my first State of the Province address, our government has a bold plan to incent investment, foster job creation, improve education and training opportunities, all to facilitate economic growth and get our economy fully back on track. We know immigration and a diverse workforce contributes to a strong economy here in Manitoba. We've listened to Manitobans. We recognize Manitoba's labor shortage is real and must be addressed in order for our province to have a strong social and economic recovery, which brings us here today. Manitoba has a rich his history of welcoming immigrants and refugees from around the world to live, work, and build roots in this, great, greatest, uh, in this wonderful province of ours. The greatest province. <laughs> Manitoba was a pioneer with the Provincial Nominee Program and has always been at the forefront of implementing innovative changes to, Canada, to uh, Canada's immigration system. 
While we are proud of our record, we know there are different areas of the labor market who need people with very specific skills to enable them to grow even further. We also need to make it easier for people to come to Manitoba and build a life of opportunity and prosperity for themselves and for their families. Today, we are pleased to announce the creation of the Immigrant Immigration Advisory Council to serve as an expert panel to recommend improvements to our current immigration policies and programs. The Immigration Advisory Council will be co-chaired by John Reyes, our Minister of Advanced Education, Skills and Immigration, and Dr. Lloyd Axworthy. Thank you both for agreeing to take on these very important roles uh, for this important initiative in Manitoba. The Advisory Council will also consist of individuals who experience the Manitoba Provincial Nominee Program process firsthand, along with representatives from immigration services, ethno-cultural communities, business, academia, and with urban, regional, and francophone representation. Work will begin immediately to finalize the Council's full membership with a final report to be provided by the end of this year. As a government, we are listening and we are committed to working with our business community, economic development partners, and Manitobans to build a stronger economy and a more prosperous future for all Manitobans. We don't want to just recover from COVID-19. We want to unlo unlock Manitoba's true economic potential. We want to find innovative ways to get more Manitobans, Canadians, and newcomers into the workforce and build themselves a brighter future right here in the province of Manitoba. I'd like to now introduce Dr. Lloyd Axworthy to say a few words. Dr. Axworthy. Um, well, let me just uh, repeat what I said. Thank you very much for the invitation uh, to uh, join with Mr. Ray on this uh, Council on Immigration. As you pointed out, this has been a long time interest. I guess really starting from the fact I'm grandson of two families of immigrants who came to the prairies in the turn of the last century. And I had the wonderful good fortune of growing up in the north end of Winnipeg which has really been an entryway for so many uh, people from around the world. So it's something that uh, I consider to be a special uh, dimension of being a Manitoban. And, uh, and I certainly uh, look forward to the idea that we are going to be able to look at ways of resetting the uh, whole issue, the movement of people, their location, their employment, and their, and their integration into our our province. Um, I think we've been facing for over two years the deterrent factor of COVID. It's, uh, it's provided restrictions and uh, some barriers. Now's the time to, uh, as you point out, the Premier, rethink. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be part of that exercise and I'll, I'll do my best. And I'm uh, very pleased to work with uh, Mr. Ray's on this knowing his own background and his own feelings for the issue. So uh, um, as soon as we can get to it, we will. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Axworthy. And I just want to say it's going to be a pleasure working with you as fellow Sister Spartan alumni as well. I just thought I'd throw that in there, <laughs> mentioning the North End. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we appreciate your commitment to this advisory council, Dr. Axworthy, and thank you for taking on this new challenge. This new advisory council is very important to me for a number of reasons. Many of my constituents have come to Canada recently, and I've heard from them how complex and complicated a process it can be. And more recently, my role in supporting economic development in Manitoba showed me that we need immigration to help grow our labour market and diversify our economy. Manitoba has a need for a range of skilled workers in the province. Our skills, talent and knowledge strategy notes that immigration is a tool that we can use to address labour and skill shortages and to attract and recruit international talent. The Advisory Council will consist of individuals with a wide range of expertise in a number of areas. For example, this will include immigration services, governance, economic development analysis, project management and community integration. 
we want to have a number of different sectors represented on the Advisory Council, including frontline immigration service providers, ethnocultural leaders, and organizations and representatives of Manitoba's business, industry, and academic communities. We also want to have urban, regional, and francophone representation, as well as past and recent nominees from the Manitoba Provincial Nominee Program. Work will begin immediately, with the final report to be provided by the end of the year. This Advisory Council builds on the success of Manitoba's Provincial Nominee Program. The program brings thousands of qualified skilled workers to Manitoba each year. More than 165,000 nominees and their families have immigrated to Manitoba from all over the world since the program began. In 2021, there was just under 6,300 applications nominated, which is the highest number of nominees since the program was established by APC government in 1998. We know these new Manitobans will use their skills and training to contribute to the long-term economic recovery and growth of our province. I want to thank my department team for their hard working in processing this record number of nominations. While we're very proud of these results, we know there are different areas of the labour market who need people with very specific skills to enable them to grow further. The Advisory Council will also be looking at the Provincial Nominee Program and the best leveraging of federal programs to see how we can streamline processes to get people to Manitoba and have them join the workforce and their communities as soon as possible. Manitoba's business leaders are the engine of our economy. They are the creators of jobs and prosperity for so many Manitobans. We have much to learn from their resilience and adaptability over the past two years, and we are committed to listening and working with the business community, economic development partners, and all Manitobans to stimulate economic growth and ensure a strong economic recovery. Thank you for your time. And I guess we'll now open up for questions, Premier. Sure. <laughs> so, when we were talking about the uh, provincial nominee program and streamlining, finding new, finding a new balance, what what could that look like in the future? What changes are you considering or entertaining? For yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, you know what? Uh, one thing that uh, in my in, in when I when I have engaged with uh, with my constituents, because uh, in Waverly we have a lot of newcomers, we hear firsthand on how the program can be improved and enhanced. And I've mentioned this to the premier, and that's why it is a major priority of hers, uh, as uh, you heard in the throne speech. And you know what? Uh, the best way that we can learn and uh, uh, to improve and enhance the program is by listening to those who have actually used the program. Okay. Um, when it comes to meeting labor demands. For for business, do you see the provincial nominee program shifting in, in some ways to focus on specific sectors uh, more than others, or what kind of targets or goals might you have when it comes to meeting demand by the um, for labor? Well, when you, yeah, I'll maybe start and then ahead, I pass it off. But but I think one you know one of the things that we heard loud and clear, regardless of where you were in Manitoba, is is the need for both skilled and unskilled uh, labor moving forward. And I think what we need to do is do the assessment of where exactly are those needs. Uh, some of that analysis has already taken place and that will obviously be uh, some of the focus and the target here. John, I don't know if you want to add anything. And Dr. Axworthy, please feel free to, to jump in whenever you'd like as well. Sure, okay. Go ahead. Well, you know what, uh, what I'll mention is you mentioned about demands and uh, the one thing about this council is that we're definitely going to have regional representation across the province because we know that demands in these regions are different. Uh, you know that we, we know that there are different sectors in different regions and that's why we want to ensure that we have different uh, members from these, these different regions and their input's going to be very valuable. Dr. Axworthy, do you want to add on that? Uh, well, I'd like to pick up on one, uh, one item. Uh, and that is that I think there's a, a lot of space now for some new pathways for labor recruitment and, and migration. But we've now, I've been chairing the World Refugee Migration Council for the last four years. And we've been heavily involved, for example, in working with our partners in North America, Central America, and others to supply a lot of our, our temporary workers, a lot of our skilled workers, that come to Manitoba. And I think we're discovering that there are some really important ways of opening up alternatives 
And uh, when we talk about, talk about the nominee program, I, I think the federal government has put some money in its budget. It's established some pilot programs. I, I think that we as partners with them can lead in doing some real innovation on how to make this work that can be a model to other parts of the country. So I, I think that this is something that uh, is has a wider uh, mm -hmm. uh, orbit than just our own province. I think that, as the Premier pointed out, Manitoba has led the way in previous nominee programs. I think there's a chance to build upon uh, on those foundations and provide that same leadership uh, coming out of Manitoba. And I, I think this, this council uh, can help the government to, to lead that way. Do you have um, overall immigration numbers for 2021 and how it might compare to uh, 2020? Yeah, the well, in terms of 2021, uh, Manitoba nominated just over 6,300 uh, applications in 2021, and that's the highest number of nominees since the program was established in 1998. But we know that uh, those uh, new Manitobans will use their skills and training to contribute to the long term economic recovery and growth of our province. And, uh, you know, we're in constant. Uh, uh, communications with the federal government to see if we can uh, expand those numbers. Mm -hmm. what, what would you like to see as far as numbers? Well, you know what? Um, right now, I, I obviously I, I won't give you a number because I know my department's actually working on that with the uh, federal government. But obviously, we'd like to see it uh, be higher than uh, 6,200. And just sorry, overall, much higher. <laughs> <laughs> and overall immigration numbers. I'm beyond just the provincial nominee programs? Well, you know, there's there's um, there's different streams. Obviously, there's provincial streams and federal streams. And I think, I think you know, uh, with the advice of the council and uh, right now with the ongoing uh, communications and uh, meetings that the uh, department has had with the federal government, uh, you know, at, uh, that uh, number will will be determined because there's so many streams out there. But I can I can definitely get back to you on that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Carl, if you want any questions. Not about this. Okay. Okay, so we'll, why don't we jump to Zoom, and then we'll come back to the room. Thank you. A reminder to our reporters on the line, you will have one preliminary and one follow-up question. Up first this afternoon from CTV Winnipeg, Jeff. Oh, hello, Premier. Uh, I'm just wondering why you don't support uh, the uh, use of the emergency. Sorry, Jeff, you're breaking up. I can't quite hear you. Oh, you can't, you can't hear me? No. Maybe, maybe try again. I. Uh, how about now? Try... <coughs> yeah, just try again. It was just sort of breaking up a little bit. Okay, yeah, I'm just wondering why you don't support the use of the federal effort. Um, here. Okay, breaking up, but I think, yeah, you're asking about the support of... Uh, of the uh, the Federal Emergencies Act, I think you know very to be very frank with you, um, Jeff. You know the situation here in Manitoba. Uh, you know we did have our first minister's meeting uh, this morning. Uh, pretty much most jurisdictions in the country have different situations that they're in right now. The situation in Manitoba, as it stands, of both Emerson and and at the legislature, just off the legislative grounds, uh, I just want to thank all the uh, law enforcement officers who have been integrally involved in that and have been developing plans uh, throughout this to help ensure that things don't escalate beyond, uh, you know, beyond control. And, and they've done incredible work to do that. Um, we have called on them to, or we have called on the, the protesters. We understand what, uh, what their concerns were. Uh, we now believe it, it is time to go home. Um, we think their, their voices have been heard. And uh, I know that, that law enforcement, you know, at some point, uh, these protests will end uh, one way or another. And we just, we encourage um, those protesters, we've heard you loud and clear. And, and in fact, after the weekend, um, there were protests, there was a counter protest. Uh, some of the other protesters who started the protests and on, uh, just off the legislative grounds actually went home themselves after that, sent us a letter and, and let them know that, uh, that they were pulling out of, of this. So I think law enforcement is doing very good work and we need to let them do their jobs. And they believe and they have assured us and reassured us that they can do that 
within the tools that exist right now in our province and that uh, the use of the Emergencies Act is, is not necessary here. So, and, and the use of the Emergencies Act is, is very, very serious um, and needs to be, you know, uh, considered um, very seriously before enacting something like that. For right now in Manitoba, we can do it under our existing laws. We know that has been the case in Alberta. And even in Ontario, where, um, you know, at the Ambassador Bridge, um, various under various uh, local laws, they were able to um, de-escalate and, and to move that beyond and, and you know, move that beyond the, uh, uh, the protests there. Uh, using existing measures where they didn't need the uh, the Emergencies Act as well. So I think it's important that Manitobans and Canadians know and understand that um, that uh, it's not necessary and, and, you know, and we need to think very carefully and clearly before going in that direction. What we don't want to do is ensure that we escalate situations uh, beyond. And my concern about invoking something along those lines is, is that that could be and, and we really don't want that to happen. Certainly, I'll speak on behalf of, of those here in Manitoba. Uh, I think, uh, hopefully, hopefully, you can hear me. Um, when the vaccine dates of passports are gone, is the app going to be activated? Can businesses still use it if they want to still check for vaccination? Will that not be allowed? Sorry, Jeff, you're... Will the app remain active even after the QR codes are no longer used? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, once we, we no longer, I, you know, I, I, I'll actually, we'll, we'll have those discussions, I guess, at, at Cabinet and internally to see what the next steps are in terms of, of uh, removing the, the QR codes, what that will look like in terms of the process and, and probably have more uh, discussions about that and, and more to reveal at a, at a later date. From the Brandon Sun, Karen. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, just for uh, for our local area, are you going to have any like specific sectors or regions that you will be focusing on? Because I speak, of course, here in Brandon, we have Maple Leaf Foods. They have uh, utilized the denomination program quite a lot, and it's. For many, they considered a success. So, are you maybe looking at models like what happened here going forward? Yeah, maybe I'll start and then I'll I'll pass it over to Minister Reyes. But uh, certainly, you know, over the course of the last several months, I've been in Brandon on many occasions. I've had the opportunities to meet with um, the uh, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, the Mayor, others in in the in the community and uh, and businesses, and certainly. Uh, a lot of uh, of those businesses have expressed a concern in, uh, you know, with with respect to uh, a shortage of of labor, and so we will be listening to Manitobans. We will be continuing to listen to Manitobans to ensure that there is uh, representation representation regionally, um, you know, so that those voices are are at the table as well. But Minister Reyes, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, you know, as I said before, there will be uh, regional representation in terms of the council. You know, I as well have been to Brandon twice uh, in my last role as Minister for Economic Development and Jobs. I actually visited one of the local small businesses that I think most Brandonites know, uh, Mr. Laird Lister, who owns the uh, the old uh, Dairy Queen with the uh, old style brazier shop, and he has uh, also a business called Kidoba. And uh, all of his uh, employees are immigrants from, uh, I believe, uh, I know from India. I know there's there's various, uh, I guess, countries that have obviously have the, you know, individuals from those countries that have come here. And immigration is very, very important for that uh, region in West Pan. And for sure, we'll definitely take uh, all the feedback that we can from all the different areas, including West Pan. So uh, it's going to be very, very important to have that regional representation. Okay, thank you for that. And I guess a related question, as you said, that you will be speaking to people who have used the nomination program and uh, gone through the immigration experience. Uh, one thing that does pop out when people talk about it is they were a little concerned about uh, culture shocks. So is that going to be uh, factored in in uh, your plans going forward? Yeah, you know what? Uh, me and uh, my fellow co-chair, Dr. Axe, already have talked about this. And we know that uh, what's going to be very important when they do come here and to 
to, uh, you know, uh, I lessen the culture shock, I guess you would say, is uh, we're going to be making sure that uh, these uh, newcomer uh, immigrant services are, uh, are, are addressed and engaged with, and we are going to have an announcement soon in terms of those organizations that will welcome those new immigrants. Hey, thanks. From CJOB, Rosanna. Hi, Premier. If the Emergencies Act does get invoked, which seems likely at this point, can you clarify what that means for Manitoba? Like, will it apply here or just in select places? It actually, like, we, we have the ability here uh, within our existing laws to be able to, um, you know, for the RCMP to take action, uh, for the Winnipeg Police Service to take action if, if necessary. Um, so we won't be needing, we, we really don't need that. Uh, certainly at this stage and and uh, so that's why we we do have some concerns about invoking it at the stage where it uh, you know where, when the RCMP and, and Winnipeg Police Service are in active negotiations um, with the with the protesters uh, we, we just hope that it, it doesn't um, you know inflame the situation and cause any um, you know uh, unnecessary negative uh, percussion repercussions as a result of of uh, of, the, of going in this direction. Thank you. And switching gears here, I was wondering if you could offer a comment on the fire in northern Manitoba, uh, the fire that killed three mm. children. Uh, the chief says you're visiting next week. Is the province sending any resources up there? So, uh, yes, I have been in touch with Chief uh, Monies as well as uh, Grand Chief Garrison Satie. Absolutely tragic situation, the loss of uh, three young children. Um, and uh, I have reached out and I will be, I, I plan on being up in the PAW for the Trappers Festival on, on Wednesday. We're trying to make arrangements to go into to Cross Lake community um, to visit with the community and to try and help them heal through this absolutely horrific situation that they're facing right now. And our thoughts and prayers are with them all. They need to know that. From the Winnipeg Sun, Ryan. Hi, I guess this is a question for Minister Reyes. Um, you talked a lot about different sectors facing shortages. Do you have any ideas like what specific sectors are facing labor shortages? Well, we know that uh, the top occupations have been transport truck drivers, food counter attendants, food service supervisors, cooks, and other customer service representatives. We know that uh, you know with our engagement in terms of the uh, business community and business organizations such as the Manitoba Business Council, there are uh, definitely shortages in uh, uh, multiple sectors, and uh, we can uh, we can uh, actually detail it more once we have those conversations with with members of the council. Okay, and um, in terms of immigration, I mean, what are some of the biggest barriers facing immigrants who come to Manitoba, and how would you go about, you know, knocking those down or exposed? Well, you know what, the, there is criteria if you go into our immigrant uh, immig immigrate to Manitoba uh, website. Uh, I guess if you want to talk about barriers, I mean, you know, as a minister for just a couple of weeks now, I've been learning about the system, and I know that you know one of the barriers has always been language. Uh, so that they have to actually have a, a certain qualification when it comes to language. There is criteria there, so I just welcome you to visit the immigrate.manitoba.com uh, website. I believe that's what it is. And, um, and uh, you'll see the criteria there. But uh, you know what, there are the, the, the barriers as well is, uh, is one of the things that uh, we have to address, and that's why we're forming this uh, Immigration Advisory Council. And I'm happy that uh, Dr. Axery will co-chair with me. From CBC Radio Canada, Mario. Hi, uh, my first question is for uh, the, the Premier. Uh, this is a fifth straight day of blockade in Emerson. Things don't appear to be changing much from our end anyways. Uh, you mentioned the unintended negative consequences that an overreach could have if the Emergency Act is applied here in Manitoba. Can you speak about the current consequences that this blockade is having? Uh, on the prop for the province. Yeah, I know. Great question. And obviously, the RCMP have been doing uh, tremendous work negotiating with the protesters there to allow uh, livestock uh, through. They're uh, continuing to uh, to negotiate to ensure that um, more transportation can get through as as well. 
and uh, we need to allow them, um, you know, to be to do their jobs. Uh, they are the professionals there, and they're working very closely uh, with them. Uh, and they feel, and we're, we're, we're in touch with them um, daily, if not several times during the day. I know our justice officials work very closely with the RCMP and the Winnipeg Police. Uh, updates as to uh, how things are going and how things are moving forward. And so um, they've assured us that they have the necessary tools to ensure that um, that they they are they are continuing to go to negotiate. We will get to uh, the end of this one way or another, and uh, you know we're just encouraging all those who are in the protests now. We hear you. We understand where you've come from, but it is time to go home. But what are the consequences if, if things don't uh, get better? If if the blockade continues for several more days? Yeah, no, I think that, uh, but again, I, we have to trust our law enforcement. They are doing their job as, as the professionals that they are. Uh, we don't direct them how to do their jobs. Uh, we know that they are the professionals to do this. Uh, we have cons expressed concern to, uh, to, to the, you know, through them to the protesters to, and, and just publicly now, just saying, and, and previously, that uh, the importance of ensuring that those goods uh, get to market. Um, this has come up uh, on a federal call. I've sent a letter to uh, the Prime Minister about this too. This all started as a result of, of mandates, uh, you know, vaccine mandates to the trucking industry. Um, and uh, that has not been helpful and has caused some challenges. So we've called on the federal government too to develop a plan. What is going to happen to uh, the border? I mean, many provinces across the country have already indicated and put forth their plans to uh, reduce and eliminate restrictions across the country. Um, we're wondering what the federal government is doing uh, moving forward to eliminate those those restrictions at our border. I also brought up, obviously, um, what discussions our Prime Minister has had with uh, President Biden as well. I certainly have had discussions with uh, the, uh, the governor of, of North Dakota, um, uh, Governor Burgum, and uh, we'll continue to have those discussions and see how we can work in a collaborative way through this. From CBC Manitoba, Lauren. Hi, this is a question for Premier Stephenson. Um, you said that you are not currently satisfied the Emergencies Act should be applied in Manitoba with the powers afforded to RCMP and police. So why then haven't we seen any action here in Manitoba to deal with the blockade, given the economic impacts we're seeing? Well, I think we have seen action, actually. We have seen, certainly, at the Emerson border, where truck, where some trucks are getting through now. Um, they're continuing to have that di dialogue. Uh, I won't get into all the details right now, but we, I am satisfied that we are uh, continuing to move forward on that front through peaceful negotiations with uh, those individuals. I think if you look at uh, the legislative grounds over the weekend, um, there was a counter protest uh, on Saturday that took place. And uh, on Sunday, there were a number of, uh, of individuals who were the original organizers of, uh, of the protest uh, just off the legislative grounds who have actually, re who have actually left and gone home now. Uh, sent me a letter and and uh, said that uh, you know they they uh, you know they're, they're they're that they're pulling out and going home. So I think that is about how our, our Winnipeg Police Service that is about how our RCMP are are doing empowered to do their jobs, and uh, they are making significant headway. Thank you. And what do you say to criticism that the provincial government is simply giving in to the protesters, allowing them to openly break the law, passing the buck on who is responsible for bringing this to an end? So, uh, you know, what I would say is it's, it's, it's not true. In fact, that, you know, uh, we have said to, uh, you know, again, we, we leave it up to law enforcement and to en enforce the laws. and. We expect that they are, and and uh, you know they're also trying to negotiate negotiate peacefully with them, and so we need to leave it to them to uh, to do their jobs and not interfere in that. Uh, we wouldn't want to be in a position where we are directing uh, law enforcement how to do their jobs. Uh, we trust them to to do their jobs, and and we'll continue to work with them. You know, we we did announce uh, last Friday um, a plan to reduce and eliminate restrictions here in Manitoba. Other provinces across the country have, 
done the same thing. And again, we're just maybe asking the federal government, what does that mean for our borders as well? Because I think if there's a clear plan out there, um, that perhaps it would give some sort of an indication to these uh, folks who are at the border um, what the plan is, and, and perhaps they would take a, you know, a different course of action moving forward. Thank you. From the Canadian Press, Brittany. Hello, Premier. Um, so people have, within the government, within your government, have said that this is a federal issue, but then the federal government has or is going to invoke this Emergencies Act. So if it is a federal government issue, I guess what should they be doing if not approving of invoking this act? Well, I think it, it really started uh, with a vaccine mandate for, for truckers. And uh, that was um, instated by the, the federal government, not the provincial government. Uh, we expressed our concerns about that move at the time. We had taken a different approach uh, to these mandates in Manitoba by requiring, um, you know, either get vaccinated or get tested. Other provinces have done that as well. Um, it just, I think it, it escalated things. It started things at the border. It hasn't been, um, uh, you know, uh, very good. And, and uh, so they, they, they sort of started this. So we're asking them what their plan is um, to move forward with respect to these mandates. What is their intention moving forward to uh, ensure that, you know, provinces have put in place their plans. And I think the federal government needs to put in place its plan moving forward with respect to the border. Thank you. What would you like to see the federal government do then with the mandates? Well, I think what they need to do is is develop a plan that will, you know, de-escalate the situation at the border. Uh, but you know, and and that's not giving in to uh, to those who are are protesting or anything. It's just it's giving an indication, frankly, for the industry on what to expect uh, moving forward. And I think with with Omicron, what we're seeing, um, the numbers of you know, an ICU, the numbers of individuals being hospitalized is is on the decline. We're seeing other provinces across the country that are putting together plans to uh, to reduce and eliminate uh, restrictions. And uh, I think we would like to see that uh, from the federal government. Again, not telling them what to do, but just just uh, wondering what the, what the plan is moving forward. I think once we give people a clear plan, um, then they know what to expect in the future. From CBC National News, Cameron. Hi, good afternoon, Premier. Um, going on to your uh, conversation with the Prime Minister and the other Premiers this morning, were you given any indication that the Emergencies Act will not be used in Manitoba? Uh, well, I think there was discussions around it. I don't think there was any definitive, um, you know, uh, recommendation that they were going to go in that direction. I think that they were um, asking, you know, sort of what provinces felt about it. And, and I think, you know, uh, you know, so those were the discussions that took place at the time. Okay. And just um, in terms of what we've seen and heard at the border, we've, um, we have cameras down there. We're seeing that some essentials are not getting across the border, including food and medical supplies. How concerning is that to you? And I mean, short of relying on the RCMP, is there anything that the province can do to ensure essentials get over that line? Yeah, I, I'm very concerned about uh, essential goods getting across the border. We need to ensure that food is being able to get on the tables of Manitobans, that other goods are, are getting through um, other essential service goods and, and other goods as well. Uh, that supply chain needs to continue, and that's why um, we'll continue to focus on ensuring that uh, the RCMP has the tools that they need to um, to uh, to do what uh, they do best, and that is navigate through this uh, through these types of of uh, uh, situations. And they have assured us that they do have the necessary tools to, you know, end the blockade one way or another. And uh, you know, we will ensure that. Uh, that uh, you know that they continue to have those tools. They have assured us, though, that they that they do without invoking um, a federal emergencies act. Premier, um, it, it, it almost sounds like you're tacit, giving tacit approval to the blockade at the border for as long as there's the vaccine mandate for truckers. 
Is, is that the case? No, I, I don't want to see the blockade um, at, the, at the border, Carol. I don't think anybody wa does. I think we want to see the, the goods flow uh, into Manitoba and out of Manitoba uh, on a free basis. I, I think that the mandate, um, when it was introduced, um, created the problem. And I think, uh, you know, uh, now we need to get out of this problem to ensure that this doesn't have a negative impact on our economy here in Manitoba and that Manitobans are able to get the goods that they need. In Ontario, they weren't able to open the Ambassador Bridge until the uh, Premier of Ontario um, invoked the Emergencies Act there and there was a court injunction and people were threatened with jail time and fines and the police moved in then. Are we waiting now for the RCMP um, to take action? Why isn't the province doing more? I mean, you're leaving it to professionals, I get that, but do the, are the RCMP saying, we don't want your help, we don't need no. your help, we're just fine, leave us alone? Yeah, no, what I would say is, we say to the RCMP, is there anything more that we can do, any other tools that we can give you to be able to, to do your job? And I think the message that we're getting back from them is that they are making some good headway, uh, with them and that they feel that they can do this in a peaceful way, that even if they have to um, take more, uh, you know, uh, take a different approach and maybe have to remove people, that they have the necessary tools in place to be able to do that now. And to the extent that they, they find that they don't, we will help. But for right now, we have been reassure, reassured by them that they have the tools that they need. Again, every province is different. Every, you know, the, the laws in every province are, are different. And, and sometimes you need the emergency um, acts, uh, you know, emergency measures uh, to, uh, you know, to invoke those in, in different provinces. Again, we'll, we'll take our, um, our cue from, from the RCMP, from the police, from the professionals who are out there on the front lines, you know, all day long, all night long, every day. Um, dealing with the situation on the grounds. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Axworthy. You're welcome. We also receive a weekly COVID-19 and vaccine update from Dr. Brent Rusin, Chief Provincial Public Health Officer, and Dr. Joss Reimer, Medical Lead Vaccine Implementation Task Force. Dr. Rusin reiterates the new rules that went into effect on February the 15th and cautions people that individual business, businesses and facilities may have their own regulations still in effect. Dr. Reimer shares some recent studies about the effectiveness of the vaccine against a cross-section of variants and the effectiveness or ineffectiveness of infection with the Omicron variant against subsequent infection with other variants. Uh, thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Brent Rusin, Chief uh, Provincial Public Health Officer for Manitoba. Want to uh, start with an update on uh, rapid antigen tests. Uh, over the last few weeks, we received additional uh, rapid antigen tests. This means we're now able to put uh, plans in place to improve access for more Manitobans. Uh, we know that uh, many uh, Manitobans have asked in the past if they could have a, a few tests at home uh, before uh, they're sick, that so that they can use if they do develop symptoms. So this wasn't really possible before due to supply. Um, but now as we've uh, received more supply, we are going to make uh, more tests uh, um, available uh, to Manitobans. So now people who uh, don't have symptoms can, can pick up a rapid test kit at uh, provincial testing locations. This will allow Manitobans to have some on hand um, if, uh, if you or someone in your, your home uh, does develop symptoms. Uh, so the supply is uh, is better now. Uh, so people uh, don't need to rush out to pick these up today or tomorrow. Uh, but something you can add uh, to your agenda next time you're running uh, errands or or near one of the testing locations. Um, so we're working with community partners as well uh, to uh, distribute these rapid antigen tests. Our, our focus is to reduce any potential barriers to individuals and to families uh, accessing these tests. The United Way Winnipeg has recently received a shipment of more than 16,000 rapid tests. And so those are gonna be distributed to social services, uh, senior and newcomer service organizations in the coming days. As additional plans are put, uh, put in place uh, to improve this access, we're gonna share uh, that in, in the bulletins or, in the, um, or online. 
so uh, yesterday, uh, Manitoba moved to yellow or caution uh, on the PRS, the pandemic response system. So this is an important transitional phase for our province and reflects that the COVID situation is stabilizing and then improving in Manitoba at this point. Uh, data and modeling uh, were shared last week uh, following the announcement of the public health orders that showed a number of the factors uh, improving, uh, those factors that we consider important to, uh, to follow in public health. As far as that shift to the yellow level, we removed uh, occupancy limits for most spaces, including private residences, and made some changes to self-isolation requirements as well. So if you are sick or test positive for COVID, stay home and follow the rules for isolation. Uh, this gives you time to recover and reduces the chances that you could uh, transmit the infection to others. Close contacts such as household members uh, should self-monitor for symptoms um, and are not routinely required to self-isolate except the where specifically advised uh, by public health in high-risk situations such as outbreaks or in healthcare facilities. If you live in a, a First Nation community, please uh, check with uh, the uh, rules in your community and ensure you, you follow those appropriately. Anyone exposed to COVID-19 should self-monitor for symptoms uh, very closely for 14 days following the exposure and isolate immediately if uh, any symptoms develop. Should always be cautious during your self-monitoring period. Avoid any non-essential visits to high-risk settings. Um, or non-essential contact with individuals who are at high risk of severe disease. As you know, other changes are planned for the weeks ahead as proof of vaccination requirements for places like restaurants and public, other public venues will no longer be required by public health. Mask requirements are set to be lifted on March 15th. Uh, for some Manitobans, um, as we've seen at, at all stages of this pandemic, these restrictions, uh, the lifting of these restrictions can't come soon enough, uh, but for others, uh, they feel they're being lifted too quickly. And so as we transition away from public health orders back into public health messaging, I'm asking all Manitobans to uh, continue to respect each other and treat each other with, with kindness. This has been uh, a difficult two years. Uh, for uh, pretty much all Manitobans. This is going to be a difficult transition uh, phase. And, and of course, we're not done uh, with COVID. Uh, so we're going to have to continue to work together um, to uh, protect Manitoba. Uh, so there's going to be people who continue to wear masks in public settings, and, and uh, some businesses may uh, require masks going forward as we, as we navigate through this transition uh, phase. Um, Matt Tobin should expect that in some settings, um, especially in healthcare facilities, personal care homes, uh, some protective measures may stay in place to protect those people who are uh, vulnerable to, to infection. So as these changes come into effect, many Manitobans might also have questions about what might happen next as we emerge from the Omicron wave. Um, our approach in Manitoba mirrors a statement issued earlier um, from my weeks, uh, my, uh, my colleagues, uh, at the um, Council of Chief Medical Officers Health. We're able to reduce restrictions at this point due to Manitoba's excellent vaccine rates. Uh, we are looking at uh, a longer term way to manage COVID-19. Uh, so it's very likely that we'll see more uh, COVID-19 in, in Manitoba, uh, more waves and more variants. Um, but we have many tools in place to, uh, to protect ourselves moving forward. Uh, vaccines being the most uh, important one. So in the coming weeks, there's still a lot we can do together to prevent uh, COVID and other respiratory illnesses. Uh, wear your mask, uh, definitely now it's still required, um, but in the future, indoor public places where distancing isn't um, easily obtained, uh, you may wanna consider uh, continuing to wear that mask. Uh, absolutely staying home if you're sick, washing your hands, covering your cough, uh, managing those group sizes. And again, especially if you're at high risk for severe outcomes, if you have underlying medical conditions, or if you're in the older age group, uh, definitely ensure your vaccines are up to date, but do manage your, your contacts. And remember, we have a treatment option now for, uh, for COVID-19. Uh, the challenge with it is it has to be administered within five days of symptom onset. So again, we, we're seeing a lot of people uh, test positive who would have been eligible for treatment 
a very beneficial treatment, but they were presenting too late in their uh, disease course. Uh, so they weren't eligible to receive this, uh, this medication. It wouldn't be effective. So please, uh, especially if you're high risk of, of severe outcomes, uh, get tested early as soon as mild symptoms develop because you may be uh, eligible for a very effective uh, treatment that helps uh, prevent those severe outcomes such as hospitalization and ICU admission. So uh, thank you uh, to all Manitobans and I'm going to pass things over to Dr. Reimer. Thank you, Dr. Rusin. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Joss Reimer, medical lead on the province's vaccine task force. As we've heard from Dr. Rusin, we're seeing a stabilization here in Manitoba. Vaccination has played a tremendous role in that happening. We know that the vast majority of Manitobans united, rolled up their sleeves to protect themselves, protect each other and our communities. The decision to vaccinate against COVID-19 has so far been made by over a million Manitobans. Together, we have chosen to heed the science, to seek to understand the safety and effectiveness of the vaccine, and to take the step to be immunized. We will never fully know, and thank goodness for that, um, what things would have looked like in Manitoba if so many of you hadn't been vaccinated. Without the vaccines, we would not have been able to keep pace with the demands on our healthcare system. Our hospitals and ICUs would have been so far beyond capacity that we would have been looking for other places for Manitobans to receive care. Without the vaccines, our schools would probably have needed to continue with remote learning for a much longer period of time. And without the vaccines, more businesses would have been forced to close, and the pressures on every sector in our communities would have been felt harder, and the impacts more lasting and more difficult. So I, I never want anyone in Manitoba to underestimate the power of your decision to protect yourselves and your community over the past two years of this pandemic. I hope that you appreciate or come to appreciate as much as I do the gift that science has brought us with this vaccine and the ability of new advancements in medical research to save lives and protect us all. All of this is to say I am incredibly proud of Manitobans. I'm proud of the teams working across the province to protect us all through immunization. And our work to continue the vaccine campaign does not end just because we're loosening restrictions. The work continues because we still need to reach those Manitobans who have not made the decision to, to be vaccinated. To that end, uh, I wanna highlight three new studies that apply to people who were infected with Omicron. The first was a study in mice. Um, mice were infected with either the original strain with Delta or with Omicron. And the scientists took their blood to see how well it could neutralize five different variants of the virus, including Omicron. What they found was that when the mice were infected with Omicron, they had a weaker immune response and their blood was only able to neutralize the Omicron variant, but not any of the other variants. The mice infected with Delta did better um, and their blood could neutralize many, but not all of the different variants. So the worry here is that it could mean that people infected with Omicron will not develop any cross protection against future variants and even that people with a Delta infection may not be protected against a future variant. <clears throat> By itself, I wouldn't put much stock into a study in mice. These types of studies are good for generating hypotheses or new ideas, but they can't confirm what's happening in humans. So if it wasn't for other similar studies in humans, I would simply have noted that this study is interesting, um, but not shared it with you today. But this study had a second half where the researchers looked at the blood of people infected with Delta to see if it could neutralize the different variants. In humans, they found that the blood of somebody with a previous Delta infection could only neutralize two of the five variants included in the study. But if that person was vaccinated, their blood could neutralize all five variants. So the researchers in that study concluded that infection with Omicron in unvaccinated individuals may not produce an immune response that protects against other variants. In vaccinated people, 
the addition of an Omicron infection may be uh, effective at producing antibodies. So a study from Austria found almost the exact same results. Um, this one was done looking at a group of people who were infected with Omicron. Some of these people who had an Omicron infection had previously been vaccinated. Some had had a history of infection before Omicron, and some had neither. They found that in people who either had been vaccinated or had had a previous infection, had high levels of antibodies produced against all of the variants. But for unvaccinated people, where Omicron was their first infection, they had only a low number of antibodies against Omicron, and they tested negative for antibodies against all other variants. So these researchers concluded that unvaccinated individuals infected with Omicron only may not be protected well uh, against infection with any other non-Omicron variant and should subsequently be vaccinated to uh, ensure that they have protection. The third study was from South Africa, where again, uh, they found that in unvaccinated people, an Omicron infection did not produce a strong immune response against any other variant. So what does all of this tell us? It tells us that if you've had two COVID infections or you've had a vaccine plus a breakthrough infection, your body does make a lot of antibodies against all the variants that we have seen so far. But if you're unvaccinated and you were infected with Omicron, you might be protected against Omicron in the future, but you won't be protected against other variants. For vaccinated or doubly infected folks, uh, we don't know how long these antibodies will last, and we don't know how well they'll work in the real world against the existing variants or any future variant. This is why we still recommend that you get your next dose to give yourself the best possible chance to fight the next variant that comes, even if you did have an infection. But what we do know is that if you never developed antibodies in the first place, which in all three of these studies was the case for unvaccinated people infected with Omicron, you are still at risk. Now, this is unfortunate. We certainly had hoped that an Omicron infection, because there were so many of them, would help prevent further infection in people going forward. And what we're seeing instead is that for people who have never had any vaccine or previous infection before Omicron, it's still critical for them to get vaccinated. And so the task force continues to work to reach those who are disproportionately affected by the risks of COVID-19. The work continues to urge Manitobans who have not yet received their third dose booster um, and parents who have not yet vaccinated their children to do so. If you've been recently infected with Omicron, you should still get your next dose um, after a few months. The school-based vaccine clinics are continuing to open their doors to members of the public um, after school hours. Children are being vaccinated in dozens of Manitoba schools right now. And overall, the school-based campaign has included hundreds of schools. There are still many community clinics operating province-wide. So I encourage you to look to see in your community what's available. Pharmacies and physician offices will also continue to offer the vaccine. And the provincial vaccine clinics still have their doors open for appointments. And the RBC Centre in Winnipeg, for example, is still open for walk-ins. So even though the majority of Manitobans are already well protected, we are not finished yet. I want to ask all of you to please reach out to friends and family members who have not yet been vaccinated against COVID-19. Find out how you can help them to make that appointment and get out the door to be vaccinated. Just because we're loosening restrictions does not mean that COVID-19 doesn't still pose a risk. It does. But it's a risk that we are working together to learn how to manage. And we'll continue to do that with vaccines being our best tool. So on behalf of the province's Vaccine Implementation Task Force, I want to thank all of you for being part of this incredible campaign. Uh, we've never seen anything like this in the history of our province. 
And so thank you to everyone who has taken part and doing your bit to protect our province.